Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where geographically you're located. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Marshall Dial. I am the VP of Simulation and Education for Hogstrike Simulation, uh, residing in Toronto, Canada. Joining us today is Dr. John Ferris from the United Kingdom, a pediatric ophthalmologist and absolutely off the charts, great cataract surgeon, as well as Dr. Ivo Ferrara from Mexico City and co-founder of Palmo University. Today's subject is how we can use technology and mentorship and adult learning science to address a gap that many young ophthalmologists have, which is their comfort level and proficiency in managing PC ruptures and the presence of vitreous during their cataract case. So what we're going to do is take you through a series of slides uh, and also use virtual reality technology. So what we hope to do is first create a baseline understanding of where we are in education for teaching anterior vitrectomy and whether or not we can in fact do better. On this subject, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ferris has done amazing work with his colleagues to really drill down into the status quo for rates of complications and how technology has impacted learning in young ophthalmologists learning cataract surgery. So Marshall, uh, thanks very much. Uh, great pleasure to be taking part in another CyberSight uh, webinar. Just looking at this first slide, the PCR risk stratification, this comes from the electronic patient records that we use in the UK to document almost 80% of all cataract operations that are done in the, in the UK. And the odds ratio you can see here is the multiple uh, of what the uh, standard PCR uh, risk is. And if you, for example, had a first year trainee operating on a brunescent cataract, that also had some pseudo exfoliation, the risk above the average of a PCR are those three figures multiplied together. So it comes to about 27% uh, chance of a PCR. Uh, and one of the themes we're gonna be following today is preventing PCR. And you can do that. One of the most effective ways of doing that as a trainee is case selection. And these are from the more than a million cases on the Medisoft electronic patient record collected by the Royal College of Ophthalmologists on their national ophthalmology database are the highest individual risk factors for, for PCR. And many of these uh, that you, you will recognize. Uh, next slide, please, Marshall. So when we look at uh, the rates of PCR, this is the first ever national ophthalmology database paper that showed that for independent surgeons, uh, there's a 1.4% risk of PCR, senior trainees, two and a half, and junior trainees, a 5% chance of PCR. Now, this was uh, published back in 2006. It's an annual audit that we do, and those figures have now fallen to about 1.1% for independent surgeons and across all trainees to just over, over 2%. Um, so still double the risk, but significantly less than it was in 2006. And in the main, this is due to the uh, mandation of IC virtual reality cataract surgery training before undertaking live surgery. Next slide, please, Marshall. So this was a study, again, taken from the National Ophthalmology Database data set, where we looked at six years uh, of surgery for first and second year trainees, 265 surgeons, in 28 centers, over uh, 17 and a half thousand cases. And we find that in those trainees who'd undergone IC training, either in their hospital or in a neighboring hospital, uh, next slide please, Marshall. It shows a 38% uh, reduction in PCR rate. So at the box in the bottom left of the slide, you can see that before IC practice, the average PCR rate for this group of surgeons was 3.5% and it fell to 2.6. So it's a 38% reduction. But in those trainees who had no access to an IC, the PCR rate stayed the same. And if we look at the fact that we perform 400,000 uh, FACOs in uh, the UK a year, 
this results in about 400 fewer PC ruptures uh, across the country. Uh, and this was the first evidence that simulation practice uh, reduces the risk of complications. So the evidence is out there that this technology works. Thanks, Marshall. The other interesting study that was done uh, in the UK recently was looking at our senior trainees. Now, in the UK, the training program is seven-year program, and 350 uh, FACOs is the minimum that our trainees need to do to uh, become a consultant. The vast majority have done over 600, 700 cases. So these were experienced trainees who'd done six or 700 cases, and they were asked how confident they were in performing a solo anterior vitrectomy. That is dealing with the PCR, performing an anterior vitrectomy, calculating the strength of Sodka's lens to be put in and implanting the lens to be put in. And you can see that over a third of the patient, of the uh, trainees felt that they were not in the position to carry out this surgery independently. And they were just about to enter independent practice. Uh, and I stress, these were very experienced uh, cataract surgeons. So rather perversely, the fact that our training has become so good, their PC rupture rates were so low, many of these trainees, they hadn't had the opportunity to practice managing a PCR. And this is why the uh, simulation techniques we're going to talk about today are so important. And not just for trainees, but also for senior surgeons to keep up their skills in managing uh, PCR. Thanks, Marshall. So with that, uh, let's go to our first survey. So uh, we'd like to ask the audience, you know, how would you feel you were trained during your residency for management of uh, anterior vitrectomy? I mean, this is, I know for residents and young ophthalmologists that I deal with, a very sensitive subject. Uh, it's also a complex scenario involving your teacher and a patient. So we'd love to get your feedback on your experience, such as it was during your training. All right, very interesting. So 35% uh, of the audience uh, was well-trained with significant live surgery. I mean, I don't know how you feel, John. That's that to me is actually quite high. So that's 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 wonderful. pretty high. Yeah, uh, and that's yeah. pretty much it. Was in the UK, a third of the of our yeah. trainees felt that they were uh, well uh, well trained, but that still left two thirds <laughs> who felt right. that, that that they they were they anxious were about anxious about the managing it themselves. So that, then we look at the uh, on the bottom of the uh, of the survey results, you know. Uh, a little over half the audience was mostly observing and had limited hands-on time or had essentially not undertaken during their training the opportunity to manage. So clearly there are some gaps in the conventional way we prepare young ophthalmologists to undertake cataract surgery and to feel that they're appropriately prepared for managing a PCR. So that's great. Um, let's, let's close that. So it looks as if we've got Evo all ready for a live demonstration, judging by the screen there a moment ago. Hopefully the technology will not let us die. Hey, here. how are you guys? Hey, yeah. Evo, good. I'm super happy we have you. Uh, okay, at this point, uh, we're going to now have the opportunity to kind of look at a paradigm shift in how we can fill that gap and create a meaningful supplemental training experience vis-a-vis the use of virtual reality and mentorship to address this gap. Uh, Dr. Farrar, will you show us how you are able to use simulation to teach an otherwise complex and you know, rare event so that uh, young ophthalmologists feel comfortable doing anterior vitrectomy? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Marshall, for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here with the great John Ferris and all the Cybersight and Orbis family. Uh, and I think you said it in the beginning, this is a simulated environment. This is a place where every, all the laws change and we're going to you know, do something extremely interesting in a controlled environment with metrics. And we're going um, to create a channel of communication between the mentor 
and the trainer uh, um, how on how to uh, especially pass skills to it to, to to the person who is in training. So right now you're going to see in the big screen uh, a simulated scenario with a posterior capsular break and vitreous that it's already stained. So this is going to be great in order for people to understand what's going on. And look at this. Also, I am completely obsessed with the hand positioning and how you, you know, how you manage outside the eye to create things inside the eye. So let's, I'm going to do something different here because simulation allows this. I'm going to do something that I, I call the most intuitive thing to do for the people who are starting. But there is three or four important mistakes in which I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm going to do things wrong, and I think that's one of the most uh, powerful things about uh, virtual simulation. So, as you can see here, I'm of course watching in 3D. This is virtual reality. This is tissues that have been modeled in order to interact, and I'm going to enter. I, I also can choose my uh, parameters, which I'm going to show in, in afterwards. And now you're going to see. You know, something that I believe it's the most intuitive thing. I see vitreous in the top and I go for it, right? I'm doing a bimanual anterior vitrectomy. I see vitreous in the top. And the first thing I do is I go for vitreous. You know, I take my time. So this is another mistake I, I see a lot, you know, the way of I move, you know, this is vitreous, this is a new structure. So what people do is they move a lot in the anterior chamber, something that's not correct because vitreous is a whole structure and you create traction and I keep going. Sometimes it's not easy to see vitreous, but sometimes you see that shadow and I keep going, you know, and maybe I get a little bit close to the posterior break. I take my time, but I keep going, I keep going, and I keep going. And, you know, when I think that I did almost everything and I removed the vitreous, you know, maybe I just, I just finish, okay? That's something that is intuitive and many people will say, okay, maybe this is the, the correct way to do it. And I'm, I'm gonna try to show in this camera, okay? my metrics, because this is one of the most important, powerful things about uh, simulation. So I got a zero, but the question is why, right? The question is what happened? And if you really see here, the target achievement, let me share it with you so you can see everything that's going on in this metrics. Okay, look at this. Look at those, the power of those metrics. The machine is telling me, there's, there was six seconds in which you pause irrigation. So something happened in the atrial chamber that wasn't correct. Then it says, well, you left some vitreous in the atrial chamber. It wasn't that much. But especially, you pull vitreous towards the atrial chamber. Many interesting things, okay? So I'm going to leave it like that, and we're going to keep going, and then we're going to try to do it again in the correct way. So thank you for, for framing the initial experience. Uh, as we move forward, uh, everybody, what we're gonna see is we're gonna start to deconstruct uh, through virtual reality, all the nuances of how you actually approach a PCR and manage vitreous in a more appropriate fashion. Okay, Evo, talk, talk to us a little bit about the three components that are possible Sunday. to be effectively trained through the use of simulation. Yes, um, that's one of the most important things when, when we are training people. Uh, I think uh, every time you face any, any step in, uh, in cataract surgery, especially in vitrectomy, we talk about three skills that you'd be artificially be thinking about. You always need the model skills. In this case, you're seeing it with my hands. You know, in my hands, I need uh, to move correctly. I need to be very careful with, uh, um, with the vitreous. 
But then, you know, uh, in the 70s, Franz Spencer was talking about the decision-making uh, capabilities and the problem-solving capabilities of a surgeon. And we call this the cognitive skills. And we are always trying to push our students in how to make the best decisions and in algorithms and how to do them. And then, and especially in this part, and we're talking, we're going to talk a lot about this with John, is about the mindset skills. I see so many surgeons that they can do a, a cataract surgery in seven minutes, eight minutes, but then suddenly you have a posterior capsule break and they freeze. And you see this as failure. So what happens when you already fail and you need to keep going? So the mindset skills, especially in this, uh, especially in this uh, surgical step, they are extremely important. If you pass the next one, please, Marshall. And for each of them, we have designed a specific uh, workshop in order how to make it. There is a way on how you learn. Uh, model skills when you're a microsurgeon, you are moving different groups of, of muscles, you need to have the correct biomechanics of your hands. Then we have algorithms in how you make decisions being a surgeon. And of course, and one of the most important ones is how to be in a peak performance state during the entire surgery. Those skills, uh, I'm sure they're one of the most important skills when you're talking about angiotomy. Next one, please. This is something I need to give a lot of credit with Mar to Marshall. This is something so powerful. Uh, and it's an analogy with another, you know, another activity that it's, uh, it's something we need to talk about and think about it. Here we have, uh, you know, another person with 38 years old who says, you know what, you know, I'm bored in the pandemic. And now I, from, from, from you know, next month, I wanna uh, do surf in this kind of waves. These kind of waves can be fun, but also can be very, uh, you know, very challenging and very dangerous. So what he does is he says, the first thing, okay, I need a coach. Great. You want to be good at something? Get a coach. But then after he gets the coach, he the coach says this, and it's so important. And actually, I think it's, it's very important for today. He says, okay, I'm going to teach you every single scenario in which you can fail and then what you're going to do when you fail so you're ready if something happens you're ready you know to mitigate the risk right marshall this is something we love this is a very important concept well i think you're 100 percent right and i think we're going to drill into that right now one of the most important things in my opinion and emphasized by uh evo there is the the cognitive skills and the psycho psychological you know skills the motor skills are something that that can be practiced but they only make up about probably 20 percent of what's important when you're dealing with uh any form of of, of complicated uh cataract surgery and over the next uh, few slides uh, and videos hopefully we'll show ways of uh approaching this um type of uh, complication and it will happen to, to all of us no matter how brilliant a surgeon you are you will have pc ruptures to deal with uh, and they'll give you just a little framework of how to just get yourself and your team into the right place to deal with it effectively because if dealt with effectively there's no reason why patients should not have an excellent visual outcome so what is the goal in antivitrectomy so we took the ultimate goal is to remove all of the vitreous from the anterior chamber, uh, avoid damaging the capsular rexus if it's intact and the iris and other uh, anterior segment structures. As uh, Eva was emphasizing there, avoid placing any traction on the vitreous. If you uh, start pulling on the vitreous, you will cause a retinal break and the patient will develop a retinal attachment. You want to preserve the chamber stability and we'll see uh, in some of the slides coming up in the videos, the instant reaction that many people have when they notice the PCR is to remove the instruments from the eye, it immediately decompresses the anterior chamber and propagates the, 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 the tear. And then once you've successfully removed the vitreous, hopefully left an intact uh, capsular axis, then you can learn how to place a three-piece IOL safely in the sulcus, perhaps with optic capture to get a nice stable uh, outcome. So those are the ultimate aims from the eyes point of view but i would add to this slide the other aim and probably more important 
is that the patient who inevitably will be awake listening to what's going on does not have a frightening experience experiences a wonderfully calm atmosphere in the operating theater and as far as they're concerned the operation is just taking a little bit longer than anticipated because of the calm and rehearsed way that the entire theater team are managing this so even if you do a wonderful antivitrectomy full of all these steps if the patient is aware of lots of anxious voices you know shouting uh, confusion going on around them uh, they will be extremely worried that something terrible has happened, even if the complication has been managed well. Uh, and that's something I want people to be very much mindful of as we go through the next slides. Next slide, please. So how to do a correct anterior vitrectomy? Um, well, at this size, the best way to handle a PCR is to avoid it happening in the first place. But if you've assessed the patient properly, beforehand and you're mindful of those uh, risks for PCR that we showed in the first slide, you will have already prepped your theatre team that this could be a potentially complicated case on the list, an elderly patient with a deep set eye with a brunescent cataract. So they already know there's an increased risk of PCR and will be mindful of, of that should it uh, happen. Practice and preparation, we'll see uh, in the coming videos how we can actually practice managing PCR at, as well as the IC simulation, some Model I simulation, and how we can use that to help prepare the entire team in theatre, not just the surgeon. So we can practice not only the motor, but the cognitive and psychological skills required. Next slide, please. So we're just going to look at some of the points at which uh, a PCR can happen. So hydrodissection. Uh, if you have uh, are too vigorous with your hydrodissection, especially in the presence of a posterior polar cataract, uh, you can rupture the capsule before you've even got a phaco probe in your hand. If you have a patient who's had multiple anti-VEGF injections, one of those injections could have accidentally touched the, the capsule, leaving a, a weakness. So gentle but thorough hydrodissection technique and in the place of a posterior polar cataract you might want to do hydrodelineation rather than a hydrodissection so this is uh, certainly one step where a pcr can occur but it's by far and away the, the rarest uh, point next slide please so if you're sculpting and uh, you don't appreciate that the lens is not as deep in the periphery as it is centrally in the phaco probe can go through uh, the base of the, the the nucleus and you get this horrible red glow popping popping back at you you can often see a little snap of the pupil as the pupil comes down and then expands again that's a surefire sign that you have gone through the the posterior capsule so maybe aggressive phaco settings not paying attention to the morphology of the lens as a junior surgeon you can have an early pcr which is certainly harder to deal with than that one which occurs later on in the surgery next slide please uh, last quadrant removal will with the FACO machines the uh, fluidics becoming more and more advanced this is something that happens less frequently than it did when, when, when I was training you know, 25 years ago when the posterior capsule was frequently bouncing up towards you um, so all the modern FACO machines whether it's a peristaltic or venturi pump system or a combination of the two it's less likely to happen but what trainees should avoid is chasing the last segment around trying to pick it up from the periphery when uh, they're not in the right position because PC rupture can certainly happen uh, if you start to um, chase sections of the, the last quadrant of the lens um, around the eye. There's a temptation for people to have the second instrument inside the eye when they're removing the last quadrant in the uh, uh, incorrect hope that it might keep the posterior capsule back. It's much better, in my opinion, to remove the second instruments you've got a nice tight uh, anterior chamber well inflated and the fluidics of the phaco machine can be relied upon to let that segment of nucleus come up to the phaco probe uh, if you have the second instrument in the eye there's often leakage of uh, um, aqueous and fluid saline out of the um, anterior chamber and you're actually more likely to get uh, uh, pc rupture next slide please Subincisional cortex. Um, just go back one. Thanks, Marshall. Uh, often you think I've got rid of the nucleus. You're kind of relaxed uh, and you know, careless uh, irrigation aspiration of the cortex can lead to rupture of the posterior capsule. Uh, and 
this is really something which should almost never occur because almost always is due to poor surgical technique. And finally, and probably least commonly, is when you incorrect uh, IOL implantation technique. Now, you have to be pretty aggressive implanting an IOL to go through a, uh, the PC if you haven't already caused a little tear there in the first place, but it certainly can happen. So let's talk a little bit about the FACO settings that are appropriate for conducting anterior vitrectomy, and then we'll jump into another virtual surgery and, uh, and, 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 and help the audience understand the importance of low flow, low vacuum, and high cut rate. Yes, of course. Uh, I think it's extremely important. Uh, and again, uh, one of the things we learn in a simulated environment is to learn how to think instead of learn how to copy a technique or parameters from another colleague. So in this case, you are seeing uh, uh, a specific machine, but what I want to transmit to you is the, the logic behind this. And I, said, I think it, it makes a lot of sense in this case that you're always gonna, have, gonna need to have a high cut rate why? Because of the principle of you don't want to traction vitreous. And of course, vitreous, you first should cut it and then you aspirate. It's extremely important because vitreous behaves that way. The second thing is about irrigation, aspiration, and vacuum. So what you want in, in, in anterior vitrectomy is you want to go smoothly and you want to control the situation. So you, you, you don't have the mindset of being fast, but to be precise. Precision is everything here. So what I strongly recommend in anterior vitrectomy is a low height of the bottle if you have a gravity machine or if you have an active uh, fluidics machine like this one that is called uh, Centurion, then you're gonna have an IOP in the anterior chamber is gonna be low, okay? About vacuum and aspiration flow, I always recommend low settings. In this case, you, have, you can have a 15 of 20 aspiration rate, sorry, because it's in Spanish. Uh, you know, we did surgery in Spanish, sorry. Uh, and, and about vacuum, also you want low vacuum in order uh, done to traction vitreous. There is something interesting here, and I would love to ask John on this case, because I have seen many, many surgeons, especially in the US, who said something very interesting. Just to, just to you know, keep the conversation and let, think about it. There's many surgeons that will say, okay, vitreous. Vitreous is what? 98, 99% of water, right? And people who will lower, lower the bottle, they would say they don't wanna hydrate vitreous. So it's like, how can you hydrate something that is already 99% of water? So you know what these guys do? They put a high uh, bottle when they're doing anterior vitrectomy. And they say that they do that because they wanna push everything back. I don't know what you do, John. In my case, I still use low bottles, but you know, there's always other yeah. mindsets around. Yeah, I uh, certainly in the UK, the teaching and my personal practice is to have uh, low, low, low bottle height, low, low pressure. It's not so much you know, hydrating the, the vitreous. One of the points we make in the slides to come is to have that irrigation well away from the, the point of, of, of the, the PCR, but I have low bottle height so that you get more control. And as you said, I vote low, low vacuums and, and, and low flow rates, but with high cut rate. And the ability to go from aspiration cut to just aspiration when you're removing vitreous and then cortex and being able to flick with your foot pedal seamlessly from, from one, one to the other. Perfect. Uh, perfect. So again, uh, we talk about parameters. You need to learn how to think. High cut, low bottle, low vacuum and low aspiration rate. Why? Because you want to control the situation. Next one, please. Okay, so now I, I think this is the perfect opportunity for us to apply this theoretical discussion in real world terms. So our next virtual surgery uh, is actually going to be Dr. Frara doing a typical cataract case. He's conducting coaxial irrigation and aspiration, everything is good. He's getting ready to put the lens in and we suddenly have a PCR and now he must convert. And all the kind of the psychological, cognitive and psychomotor skills and decision-making uh, elements are gonna come into play. So I think we're gonna do L5. That's correct, uh, but, but guess what? 
uh, as always, I have a surprise because uh, I really want people, you know, uh, sometimes they see me that I have experience with the machine and they will say, you know, okay, he makes, it makes sense. He knows the machine, but we're going to put one of our great students to do it. And I'm going to comment. Uh, why? Again, I think it's extremely important for people to understand that simulation is the way that in my humble experience, simulation now became the gold standard to train so many things, specifically this one, when we have complications. So again, we're, we're going to have one of our students to come and I'm going to try to comment. Uh, and John, of course, you, you are, a, you know, this is the other power of simulation. You're going to be a virtual mentor from 7,000 7, kilometers. So she's going to be, you know, in a great situation. So we have Ali here. We're going to do, again, let me talk to you about this scenario. <laughs> So we have, uh, again, um, a scenario in which she's going to do INA, as you're going to see here. There you go. So there is still cortex in the, in the anterior capsular bag. The bag, it's not broken. Okay. So now, and, and I think it's extremely important also for you to understand that she has many, many things uh, to, to, to show or to use. She has a lot of uh tools she has uh irrigation aspiration she can choose uh a vitrector she has stremcinolone she has viscoelastic so imagine she's gonna be doing um you know a decision making on steroids here so you can start she's gonna do the ina uh by manual okay she has an aspirator in the red um tienes el acá el irrigador dale Position uno, y entra, okay, very good. So you're gonna see she started with irrigation. Now she's gonna do the INA. Perfect, and then suddenly something bad's gonna happen. No matter what she does, something bad's, oh, and that happened. I hope you can see it. I, I see it perfectly through the screen. So she has a big posterior capsule break. And this is the moment. This is the key moment in where everybody, you know, freezes and everybody brings everything out of the eye. And that could be a big problem in this case. Why? Because you don't want to lose the pressure on the anterior chamber. She did something great. So she stepped in position one and she put viscoelastics in the anterior chamber. Okay. That single maneuver is extremely important. Why? because she is keeping the positive pressure in the anterior chamber. One thing she could do is she had tramcinolone. She was able to put tramcinolone to visualize vitreous a little bit better. But guess what? In the operating room, I challenge anybody who has tramcinolone ready in that specific moment. So, you know, it's not easy to have tramcinolone ready because you are doing FACO and you have high confidence and you're not going to break the capsule. Tell me, John, any other comments on that specific No, maneuver? I think that was absolutely essential. So obviously you knew that the PC rupture was going to happen and you're pretty mm -hmm. relaxed. But one of the, the, the dangers is when it comes to the cognitive side of things, there's a human reaction to deny that it's happened, to wish that it hasn't happened. But what you must, and Brian Little and Larry Benjamin, great UK trainers, talk about the danger of denial. Do not deny it's happened. Recognize the signs, which she did. And then rather than panic and remove the instruments, do exactly the correct thing. Keep the infusion going and then tamponade the, the anterior chamber. And then you can pause. Then you can just stop uh, and get your team ready to carry out the next bit of the procedure. And that's, as you were saying, Eva, the most important thing. Um, to think, yes, this has happened, but I'm relaxed. I know exactly what to do, and so does my team, and then carry on. Okay, great. So now she did a second thing again, as you can see in the machine, the settings. Okay, so we have, let me show you the settings perfectly. So she has a 45 um, centimeters of height of the bottle. She has a vacuum of 175 and a high, high cut rate of 3000. And again, the anterior vitrectomy is about the parameters, but about how you behave 
in the in, in the tear chamber. So she did something, I don't know if you were able to see it, but she did something which I always recommend and it's extremely important for me. That is what? That is, she went below the rupture, below the level of the posterior capsule. And that is exactly because of one of the most important principles of a chair vitrectomy is she's not pulling vitreous from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber. And then there is another discussion to come because probably there is many American um, surgeons in the audience. And we know that there's many American surgeons that will uh, even choose to access an anterior vitrectomy through pars plana. John, tell me your thoughts on that. Yeah, and again, this uh, five years ago when I was uh, teaching in the US, uh, this was mentioned to me and almost nobody that I know in the UK would, even the VR surgeons, would do an anterior vitrectomy via pars plana approach if they've already made a, a, a faker wound. So it does seem to be a well-recognized way of, of doing it, uh, but in the, the UK, everybody that I know would do it through this bimanual anterior approach. And to me, it's a very controlled approach, uh, and it's certainly the one I would prefer, but I think equally valid doing through the parts planar if you're already a trained sort of uh, fit your retinal surgeon and are used to that approach. Excellent. So now there is another important thing that Alan needs to do is, okay, uh, she took care of vitreous. Uh, my, uh, what I'm teaching here, my mantra is always for people not to forget to say, if you seek vitreous, you go for vitreous. Okay. So you, even, even if you have a lens, a piece of lens, or if you have cortex, if you see vitreous, you go for vitreous. Why? Because if you enter the anterior chamber with another objective, you're going to create uh, main, probably a couple of important problems because, you know, you're going for INA or the lens and then you're traction in vitreous a lot and vitreous is, can stick into the handpiece, into the uh, aspiration. So it's very important. So now that she deal with vitreous and you can see that posterior capsule break, it's, it's amazing. Uh, it, it's completely closed. Now she's going for... Uh, the cortex. Um, there is something important here is that sometimes you can go actually with the detractor for cortex. And that's what we were showing in the, right, in the parameters. Sometimes you just put the cutting, you can put it off, and then you can go for, uh, with the aspiration for cortex. John, what are your thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. So I will use the detractor uh, settings to have either cut IA or just irrigation aspiration. And at this point, I'll be using the vitrector just set on aspiration mode to aspirate the cortex. And then if I see a little bit of vitreous coming forward, I'll put some more triamcinolone in and just with the foot pedal kick right, and that will go to uh, cut IA, remove the vitreous and kick again, go back to aspiration. And in a fraction of a second, you can just flick between those two modalities and safely remove the residual cortex without damaging the capsular axis. And at the same time, you know, being able to remove any little bits of vitreous that might still come forward into the anterior chamber. And I think it's a really neat way of, uh, of, of doing it. Great. And I, great. Believe, and I, believe, I believe the IC can be set up now. Uh, the foot pedal yes. can be configured to let you do that, Evo, is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, we can put the cutting off and we can do the, the aspiration with the and look at this, just to, to end, she before she left the irrigation, she put viscoelastic. This is something so important for me. And there is so many people that, you know, can forget about that. And I think it's, it's extremely important to do. In this case, but let's do it. The only thing that happened, she did everything great. Okay, so the metrics went to zero because we were waiting for you in the comment and we stopped well, we'll we, we transitioned from uh, when she was doing uh, anterior vitrectomy to INA. So the machine said, you know, you paused the irrigation and she removed 100 points, but that was only because of, of we were waiting. But she did everything great. Look, she didn't left any vitreous in the anterior chamber. She even removed the vitreous from the directly below the capsule where the break was. 
and she didn't almost didn't pull any vitreous from the back to the front. So again, imagine this. Ali here is training with two mentors. One she one is with her, the other one is 7,000 kilometers away. She has metrics on what she did. She's doing a test that she can repeat what? Five, 10, 20, 100 times. And she has objective metrics with that. There is no other way on how to train this. Um, I don't know if you have any last comments for this simulation activity, John. No, I think uh, you've summarized uh -huh. it beautifully there. And I think the other, the only other comment I would make is that when you're just removing the instruments from the eye, say you're going from cut to IA, just have the cutter on until you're just taking the instrument out of the eye and that minimizes the chance of having any little strands of vitreous there. Uh, I'm not sure again with the modern iterations of the IC whether we can effectively inject myocol uh, at the end to shrink the pupil to see if there's any little strands of vitreous coming up to the to the wound because that's another thing that would be you know great to simulate and, and practice before you know, putting the or having put the, the lens in place, but uh, that, it, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, yeah. Thanks, a great demonstrations and you know, well done to your student. I, I just noticed the book on top of the IC there, uh, Ego is the Enemy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very, very appropriate, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, and, and let, let me do a comment since, since people are, are answering. Uh, we we have been uh, with a, an approach lately about seeing cataract surgery as a process. Like uh, let's let's be engineers and let's see you know in which part of the process there is big risk. Uh, even engineers they do uh, risk management you know activities. So I think it's extremely important for you to see where problems can happen so you are more aware of them, right? And I really like the answer. Actually, no, but please, John. Your yeah, I, mean, I think yeah, quad, quadrant removal, uh, I would uh, uh, agree, is the one where there's the highest risk. And uh, that can, of course, be when you're sculpting, you can accidentally go through the anterior, uh, go through the rectus, and then rips around the, the back. If you're chasing bits of... Uh, uh, fragments of nucleus around the bag rather than letting them come to you if you're trying to peel away uh, epi epinucleus if you're employing an incorrect chopping techniques where the chopper catches the, the bag uh, and operating on, on dense cataracts and finding you're suddenly going through the back of the, the, the capsule um, but it was interesting to see IA being as, as low as, as low as it is and that's what it should be I mean it shouldn't really happen with irrigation aspiration once the nucleus is, is, is removed. Um, so quadrant removal is certainly the time where I see it most commonly with our trainees in the UK at the moment. No, no, I, I, will, I will say that I agree 100% with quorum removal, but in the second spot from my experience and what I see around the world, I will say that INA will be higher than that. Uh, especially even for a confidence level, I see that many people just, you know, the the nucleus is uh, it's out, everything is fine, and they they start rushing the the surgery. Especially in the subincisional part, I see many posterior capsular breaks that we could avoid as as the second, you know, place in where a posterior capsular break can happen. Sorry, Marshall. No, I, I actually, this is probably one of my favorite parts of the whole discussion and, and, and something, again, I think uh, the folks in the UK are way ahead of the curve on. And that's looking beyond the surgeon experience to the larger OR dynamic of the team. Uh, John, do you want to share with us some of the really progressive? Yeah, well, this is, this is a, a concept popularized by my friend and colleague, David Lockington uh, in, in Glasgow, and he calls it the fire drill for, for PCR. Uh, and if you think of you, if you've watched your Formula One team, when the uh, car comes into the pits and they change four tires in about eight seconds, there's about 20 people around that car. Every single person in that team knows exactly what to do and what their role is, how they have to do it to get a smooth ex execution of that, of that pit stop. And that's what your theatre team should be. Uh, everybody in that room needs to know exactly what they should do. 
And with the checklist performed before the operation, they should also be informed of which cases are more likely to be a complicated uh, procedure or not. So how can you actually practice this? Can you have some immersive theatre team simulation with unscripted complications? Uh, and you very much can do that. We'll see in the next slide how that's done. But one of the David's uh, tips for this is to have the bag with everything you're going to need to manage a PCR. So you've got the triamcinolone, you've got the myocol, you've got some 10 -o or 9 uh, proline uh, nylon uh, sutures ready for uh, securing the wound if needs be. You've got the anterior vit vitrector. Uh, so you're not, when you have a complication, saying to the nursing team, please could you go and find these bits of kit. It's all in one place in the vacuum machine and everybody knows exactly uh, what they should do. Another thing that we sort of stress to our UK trainees is that all ophthalmologists should know how to set up a, their fake machine for an anterior vitrectomy and not just rely on the scrub nurse. Because you may find you're operating one day with the scrub nurse who's not very experienced uh, and you need to be able to do it yourself. Uh, and at our courses, it's interesting to see how many people actually know how to set up the machine themselves. So we'll show the next uh, video of uh, the fire drill in action and we tend to do this at, you know, at the end of a routine operating this once every three or four months uh here we are in theater in, in cheltenham paul tomlin's one of our corneal surgeons has got one of our the modelized the philip studio modelized and there's been a pc rupture and he's saying to heidi senior scrub nurse and imogen who's a runner uh and they very calmly just set up the faker machine now at this point in time in real life, you will have done what we've seen in the simulation. You would have stabilized the anterior chamber, you've removed the instruments from the eye and start thinking now about what you're going to say to the patient. You're just going to say, we're just going to take a little longer to finish your operation. We'll be some extra maneuvers. I hope you're comfortable to make sure they're not uh, in any pain or discomfort uh, and talk them through the whole thing. And Larry Benjamin, one of my mentors in, in the UK, He's fond of saying to uh, use your dinner party voice. So rather than saying, please get me the antivitrectomy now, sister, you just say very politely, please, sister, can please you sister, set up yeah. the machine for antivitrectomy? And it's that <laughs> calm tone of voice as if it's very much a matter of routine that reassures the patient, reassures the staff around you that you are in control, that the team is in control. Uh, and that's what we mean by sort of fire drill training. And here's the uh, model I being used it's a cataract eye which has uh, had the posterior capsule ruptured. It's filled with egg white. So Paul is now staining the egg white with a triamcinolone substitute and carrying out an anterior vitrectomy. So the people in theatre have had practice in setting up the machine, getting the instruments out, uh, and actually talking as if you're talking to uh, a patient. And I would highly recommend everybody who uh, is involved in the theatre team to instigate this form of fire drill training. Uh, and on the simulated ocular surgery website, there's details of how to use this type of simulation. Thanks, Marshall. Okay, uh, on that note, uh, now we're going to actually look at some of the available resources that you can tap into. Uh, John just mentioned this amazing gallery that's available online, and, and, uh, and maybe you can share that with us a little bit, John. Um, yeah, so linked to the simulated ocular surgery website, the simulation gallery where people send us their videos of surgical simulation. And all the techniques that Ivo's been, uh, Ivo's been showing on the IC teach you a lot of the uh, manual dexterity and the cognitive skills, but to actually put it into practice in theatre with your microscope, your vitrector, is, is the next step uh, to that. And of course, with the simulation that we've seen on the IC, uh, the trainee there knew what was going to happen. You can, you can doctor these model eyes so somebody can be doing a FACO without realizing we've already ruptured the posterior capsule with an NVR blade or damaged the zonule. So it's like pilot simulation where they're having their flight simulation. They don't know whether it's going to be a bird strike or an engine going out or the landing gear not working. Uh, and that's true immersive simulation where people in the theater and the surgeon does not know what complication is going to happen. Uh, and that's a real test of whether you're ready to deal with these type of uh, uh, rare scenarios. And this is a video here of showing, okay, Marshall, you go to the, the next one if you like. Okay. 
So no, actually, I'll keep replaying this. It just shows you uh, with the egg white vitreous, uh, the triamcidolone substitute, which is made with a calcium salt. And again, the video on the simulation gallery has the recipe you can use. And when the sodium salts in the egg white mixture react with the calcium in this triamcinolone, you can see how it becomes this really gloopy, tenacious liquid, which is just like vitreous. So the skills you've practiced on the IC, you can now practice with your vitrector using the foot pedal to clear that vitreous away, make sure there's none left in the capsular bag or in front of the iris, and then inject more egg white, more triamcinolone. You can practice for half an hour as long as you like, really, in removing the vitreous using the cutter uh, on your own vitrecting machine. So it's a nice, it's the next stage from the virtual reality to actually practicing in theater with your team. And it's highly realistic. And these eyes can be used time and time again to do the same form of simulation. So this video is from the CyberSight website and uh, shows you what happens when you're carelessly just removing the last pieces of the cortex here. So watch carefully what happens. Oh, that star thing that knows a PC rupture, a hole. They recognize the complication, but what, they, what do they do? What shouldn't they do? And what they shouldn't do is remove the instruments from the eye. Should do what we saw in the simulation earlier is keep the irrigation going. Tamponade that you can see how that small PC tear suddenly becomes a much larger one with much more vitreous prolapse. So recognizing the sign, ideally refluxing, kicking left with the foot pedal uh, to stop the PC tear. But if it does happen, get the OBD, get some viscoelastic in there without the eye anterior chamber decompressing, tamponade the brake, control the tear. And then you can have the conversation with the scrub team about setting up for your anterior vitrectomy. So a nice example of what not to do. Thanks. Okay, so that brings us to our third and final survey question for our audience. What is your confidence level managing prolapse vitreous if you encounter a PCR? And again, you know, in, in, in this kind of question, I, I like to put a little bit of philosophy in it, right? And what confidence means, because you can be confident, but maybe you, you don't have the correct knowledge to make decisions. So I think we should always think about what, what it means to be confident in this kind of case. I had a, a great student a couple of months ago who she will say, hey, I can be so confident and everything, but give me a correct algorithm in you know which decisions to make in every possible scenario and my confidence is going to boost in that moment so i think this is one of the exact moments to do that let's see what people think you know and actually since the beginning we have a very interesting uh let, let's be honest we have a very interesting audience here because there is a lot of people mm -hmm. and many people said that they have been training in the chair vitrectomy I can say that there's many people who, who didn't have like formal um, formal train, but here, even if they have correct training, you know, the, there is lack of confidence in many of them, right? Which is good. I think that's the most important thing. Start with being humble and you know, identifying that we all we all have a lot to learn. John. Yeah, no, absolutely, I agree. And again, those those figures show the need for this type of training to access to not only the virtual reality simulation but even the the, the model eyes is highly effective uh, as, as well uh, and just going through in your own mind and almost rehearsing what you're going to say to the patient say to the the team because you've done that that's another thing you've practiced and there's not that pressure when it happens to communicate with your with the scrub team with the nurse and actually think about what you should be doing but it, it's okay to pause once things are stabilized and then a deep breath 
and think, right, now we're ready to go again. It's not a rush. It's not a race. It should all be managed, as you were saying earlier, Evo, slowly and calmly. Uh, and every single anterior vitrectomy, just like every cataract surgery is different, but in particular, every anterior vitrectomy is different. And as long as you've got the basic principles that we've outlined today ingrained in your brain, uh, then you will end up with a, with a good result and hopefully a good visual result and, and happy patient. For the in interest of time, Marshall, but this video can be seen on the CyberSight website. It doesn't really add you know, too much to what uh, uh, we've, we've been talking about. We can probably okay. just go to the, the command, the uh, maybe the last live uh, simulation okay. if we're going to do that. Well, I, I think, yeah, let's do that. Or just the 10 commandments of the... Okay, let me see. If I can... All right, this, actually, I think this is actually a perfect setup for the, the last live virtual surgery. Um, because it really speaks to the paradigm of it's a, it's a high risk situation, but one that does not happen frequently. So how do we as professionals prepare ourselves adequately for something that happens so infrequently? Um, and I think this whole kind of dialogue has been about finding non-patient encounter based mechanisms by which we can uh, assure ourselves that we have surgical readiness. So with that, Evil, do you want to take us to the last uh, live virtual surgery? Yes, sure. Let, let me comment a little bit about what John said, because again, uh, look how they're planning for something that can be uh, so stressful, uh, so complicated, because this is a complicated scenario and they are proactively simula simulating what's going to happen. And they have uh, one of the best uh, healthcare systems in the world. And let's be honest, in many other parts of the entire planet, you see ophthalmologists with clinics. So you don't have all that staff who is well-trained and there's a lot of communication. So I think what you just said, John, uh, with also David, uh, this about the fire drill, this is something that everybody should do around the world because sometimes they're doing surgery in different scenarios with people who are not very well-trained. And yes, we're gonna simulate the task itself, but this is a team, right? This is a team um, uh, activity. So you need to also train the people who are gonna be uh, giving you, you know, all the instruments you need and helping you with new stuff that they're maybe not uh, very, um, very used to use, like Tremcine alone, like the anterior retractor. There is so many important things. About this, uh, I would like to have another student and I want her to go back to level number seven so we can see very fast, you know, how she's gonna perform what I did completely incorrectly in the beginning, she can do it right. So, adelante. Okay, so I think, again, this is extremely important. You said it, Marshall. This is not gonna happen frequently. You know, we have an amazing student that she's in her uh, learning curve as we speak, and she came to train with us for two weeks. So my question to you and, and my question also to you, John, is are you competent if you did 200, 300, 400 cataract cases, but you're not competent doing anterior vitrectomy? So this is exactly what is happening to her right now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is where the virtual reality similar later, if you have access to the IC, it's, it's so invaluable. Vitrectomy. Okay. Okay, so remember guys, level number seven, you have a posterior capsular break, the vitreous is already stained with Tremcine alone, and now she needs to make decisions based on the most important anterior vitrectomy principles, which is always have positive pressure in the anterior chamber, don't bring vitreous from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber, and don't traction vitreous. So you see her movements are very slow and very controlled. She went directly to a lower level with the vitrector. So as you can see that in that this exact moment, you're gonna see vitreous that is going down. You know what I mean? It's going low. It's not going through the main decision. So vitreous is slowly, because she's taking her time, right? Going to the posterior, chamber and you can see the vitreous that is not stained right in the bottom 
Uh, and that's the good thing. So again, she has the correct parameters. She is making sure that she has positive pressure in the interior chamber. And now she's taken the time, right? This is a completely new mindset. This is not cataract surgery. If it takes 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you need to take those 40 minutes. Uh, and I think one of the most important things, John, is that sometimes you see this as failure, but if you really take the time and you, you do things right and you threw a three-piece IOL in the sulcus, these <laughs> patients, they do so good in the post-op. No, they absolutely no, no. do perfectly well. And they don't no. need the YAG capsulotomy. Elastico, doctora. Okay, she did a mistake. Uh, she's going to be penalized. She decompressed the capsule. You know, this is... The, this is this is training. This is real life. So no, so she, you know, she's gonna have a bad score now. She was coming great, but in the end, she did decompress the capsule, the, the interior chamber. So yeah. still very nice up to that point. Very nice up to that point. Yeah. Okay. So she did everything good. Again, this is the way how you how you learn. You did, she did everything good. She didn't lift any vitreous in the interior chamber. She didn't lift vitreous below the capsule. She didn't put vitreous, but she decompressed the anterior chamber in the end. So what happened? What's going to happen? Exactly what we're, you were showing in the in the video, right, John? You know, yeah. It, even the hole sometimes it gets bigger because the vitreous comes to the anterior chamber. Yeah, yeah. Very good. We, we, I don't know, Marshall, if you want, if you want us to do another, because again, uh, you guys saw two levels and we can have, we have seven levels. We have many levels in which vitreous, you know, are sticking to many substances. There is so many different things, but I think that I love that slide. That slide, yeah. I think is going to summarize everything we have been talking about. Yeah. So as just to summarize, before we go on to questions here, it's that mental transition to different surgery. So know the signs when the victory, when there's been a PC rupture, don't deny it. You're wishing it hasn't happened. It has happened, but don't deny it. Don't remove the instruments from the eye, uh, tamponade the eye and then make decisions. And they've got that psychomotor transition that we were talking about, knowing about your, your cutters, that's all set up, sealed down to your chamber and the approach. Anterior is my preferred approach, Horace planar if you're trained to do that. And then these bimanual techniques with no traction, starting at the level of the PCR, working up anteriorly uh, and completing that vitrectomy, which may have to be done in stages if you're removing cortex at the same time. Triamcinolone is your friend. The vitreous is a ghost, as Larry Benjamin would say. Uh, it's hard to spot. So judicious and copious use of triamcinolone to identify any vitreous strands in the anterior chamber up to the wound. Uh, decision making, once you've removed the vitreous and the cortex, the decision you have to make is, is it safe to implant a sulcus lens? If it is, then what strength of sulcus lens are you going to choose compared to the strength of the lens you're going to use in the bag? That's a whole new webinar in itself, really. Uh, and how to implant that lens safely. Uh, shrinking down the pupil with your myocol, making sure there's no little strands of vitreous, uh, communicating calmly and empathetically with your patient throughout, uh, speaking to the patient immediately after the operation, speaking to them before they go home and their relatives, meticulous follow-up. So you're going to see them the next day, check the pressure, make everything, sure everything's well. And the following week, you do not want to lose these patients in a big hospital system. And by looking after them so well, they're often that your most grateful patients. Because not only should they have a good visual result if you've followed all of these steps, but they've been looked after extremely well. And that is so important. Patients who like their doctors, who feel they've been well looked after and who haven't had a frightening experience, have had a reasonably pleasant but slightly longer experience in theatre, uh, are much less likely to sue their surgeon uh, and be happy with the outcome. So communication is absolutely key. I cannot stress that enough, as well as the other surgical and cognitive skills that we've spoken about. Uh, thank you, Marshall. Okay, that's a wonderful 
sort of summarization of all the key takeaways from today. There are a few questions, gentlemen, that it, it, that we'll try and get through. We're a little over time. Maybe so there can... are scenarios, Marshall, where you, if you're not sure, if you think, is there enough support there? Say, for example, there has been an anterior capsule tear and you're not confident there's enough support there at the time. Sometimes, you know what, it's best just to leave the patient a fake ache clean the vitreous up, make sure you've done a nice job, explain to the patient that we haven't put a lens in at, the primary, at this surgery, we're going to let the eye settle down and then, you know, make a decision, especially if the patient's becoming uncomfortable, the local anesthesia is wearing off, the operation's gone on for 35 minutes or more, you know, there's no shame in that. And sometimes that's the best option. You can then reevaluate and decide, Camberley and clinic, whether there actually is support for a, a sulcus lens, whether it needs to be maybe a sutured lens. Uh, and it's obviously disappointing to the patient because they were very poor vision being a faking. But I've certainly done that uh, in the past and ended up with a good visual result. But again, that comes down to communication and decision making. And if you really think that it's going to be hazardous to put a lens in, then uh, I would suggest just leaving the patient a fake fake okay. until you're confident you know what lens put in. I, Eva, I don't know what you, you think about that. I agree 100%. And I especially like uh, that you, you are teaching people how to think, okay? You need to evaluate every single case, as you said, John. These cases, I think in, in, in cataract surgery, we more uh, are more aware of what's going to happen and it's easy to make decisions, but in anterior vitrectomy, everything changes. So you need to evaluate every single case and you need to make the best decision for that patient. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next question, uh, gentlemen, uh, how do you handle the lens pieces uh, when you, a PCR occurs during sculpt or quadrant removal? And that's a, and that an entire webinar, but, uh, <laughs> But again, yeah, because the decision-making process, uh, again, is so complex. You're going to base in very important principles. And then you need to assess, okay, is vitreous present? Is vitreous not present? And then also you need to assess, is the, the, the piece of the lens hard? Is it soft? How is that the characteristics of the rupture? Is it a hole small in the center? Is it a big, you know, tear? There is so many variables that we could be here two or three hours talking about different scenarios, right, John? Absolutely, absolutely right. And as you say, whether it's a small hole, the red hole at the scalp stage, or whether the whole thing has the, the bag's gone and you're just trying to prevent uh pieces of the nucleus floating into the vitreous but the, the, the one thing I would say if it's quite obvious that the lens is going to tip and fall into the vitreous do not go chasing it with your phaco probe do you know what just let it fall because if you can't retrieve it you think uh, I'm an anterior segment surgeon uh, you're just going to have to let it go swallow your pride and get the VR team uh, in there to, 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 to help to help you out uh, do not think, do you know what, I think I can get this piss, it, it, it's only got into the vitreous a little bit, just do not ever chase a piece of the nucleus with your phaco probe, you'll make things 10 times worse. So with a big PC rupture that happens, a wrapper on tear, and you can't safely float the remaining nuclear fragments up into the anterior chamber, yeah, you just have to cut your losses and uh, involve the, the VR team. Do you know what, they'll do a nice job, they'll remove the pieces of the lens, uh, and then you can help with the uh, IOL selection, but yeah, don't go chasing bits of nucleus uh, behind the posterior capsule or what's left of it. A degree of pragmatism is always a healthy thing. Uh, last question, gentlemen. Any, and this is, I think, a subject Evo and I talk about a lot in terms of equity and access to resources. And one reason I'm so grateful to be part of uh, this activity with Orbis. Uh, any suggestions for simulation ideas in low-income countries with little or no access to an IC simulator? Well, that's we really need the Philips Studio eyes, with the advanced cataract eye, which can be used time and time again. You've done the FACO with it. It can only be done once, but you've got a PC. Uh, you've got the capsule in there. You rupture that. You can fill it with the egg white solution. As long as you wash it out after each practice, that eye can be used multiple times to practice an anterior vitrectomy technique with the egg and sodium salt solution and the made up triamcinolone solution, you know, cheapest chips, easy to do in your own theater. And it's safe, no matter what your theater nurses say, it is safe to take these and the egg 
uh, white solution you know, into theatre and use it with instruments you operate on, with uh, on, on patients. Uh, and that's a you know, cheap way of replicating at least some of the motor skills. But of course, you don't get the detailed feedback you get with the IC, but uh, you will get used to handling the instruments and removing uh, vitreous and using the foot pedal, which I think is, is really invaluable. So there is a, a cheap alternative way of, of doing things. Wonderful. Um, with that, I think we're a wrap. Uh, Dr. Ferris, Dr. Farrar, thank you very much for your time and sharing your wisdom. Uh, Dr. Farrar, uh, the resources that you have at Obama University and your passion for sharing knowledge to young people is amazing. Uh, we're all grateful to Orbis and the folks at CyberSight for creating this platform by which we're able to all be here today. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. Uh, if you were unable to attend, uh, CyberSight will have this uh, tomorrow online, and uh, people are more than welcome to access this at that time. Thank you all, and have a good day or a good evening. Thank you Bye -bye. very much. Gentlemen, thanks. Thank you Bye -bye. very much. Bye-bye.